and we are live what is going on so wanted to do a quick video or maybe a deep dive video into the whole history of all this stuff uh, that's just coming out a lot of a lot of new stuff has happened so three days ago cnn uh Fo fox news and um 60 minutes and a bunch of other networks covered this uh break in, in this havana syndrome a bunch of uh, they've been collecting intelligence on this havana syndrome stuff for five years and this is their final report on all of it and um yes yeah, some serious stuff uh, we're gonna we're, we're gonna get into that and talk about that um and uh I don't yeah, it's it's an interesting topic this evening for sure um yeah so this is uh this is crazy stuff um there was an earthquake this morning here in uh new england just off the coast of like rhode island and and uh and montauk i think um out right out right out if, you know between new york and rhode island d down in that area it was felt through um massachusetts and stuff um but yeah, so weird stuff going on. Um, I'm going to talk about these systems. Uh, I shared some links in the description. Of course, the uh, image here that was in the thumbnail caption was uh, a directed energy rifle prop used in the TV series Arrow. So that's not an actual, you know, real machine. It's just a prop that was built uh, to to you know, simulate or emphasize uh, an advanced form of, of these weapons that would just be, um, you know, a big capacitor bank maybe and, and some uh, phased array um, systems sort of for ranging and, and, and scaling um, with, a, with a scope of some kind maybe, uh, or this is a pair, it looks like a parabolic dish, but this is the parabolic antenna that goes into it. I don't know, um, but in any case, um, we'll talk about the real systems and how some of that uh, history of that technology works and, and whatnot. It's a, it's a good deep dive and this brief overview is, is a good starter. And we'll, I'll, I'll even show you some videos of where you can, you know, start experimenting with your own different uh, phased array antenna systems and, um, you know, start with a two wave, uh, a two, a two uh, antenna um, transmitter and then work your way up to more complex systems that are, um, you know, directional and, and tunable, um, pointable, like the, the HARP system up in Alaska. So, so the HARP system in Alaska is, is a series of these antennas that are all lined up in a grid. So they added it's additive um and it's a phased array kind of thing so that they can they can phase the uh controllers and the controllers are in each one of these massive trailer uh power stations with a you know transformer box uh hardwired into the ground you know this is some serious electrical equipment that that's running up there in alaska and um you know you can't see the it, it could be running in any one of these pictures. You wouldn't actually, it wouldn't actually look like this. You wouldn't actually see the radiation uh, of these, these frequencies that these, these towers are emitting. Um, it's, it's invisible to the human eye, but it's um, the way they do it with this, this phased array of um, a series of multiple antennas is they can time they have an array and then they phase it so that the timing, the sequencing um, can send off, you know, these directional wave fronts. You see how they time the signals that go across there to, to, to make these directional wave fronts so they can point the antenna anyway for 45 degrees um, either way, either direction from the, uh, the source. It's about a 90, what is that, you know, so they have 45 this way and a 45 that way. So that's a, uh, that's, Ninety, yeah, ninety meters or ninety. Uh, that's a ninety. So you get four of these set up, and and, and they have these blocks too, um, where where there's um, four of them, four of these bad boys set up. So phased array. Sorry, I was doing the calculation in my head. 
um, for the pause there. Uh, but yeah, you get a um, one of these block um, arrays. They oh, where's the big one? Yeah, this thing right here. So check this thing out. So they have this thing set up, and um, it's got one on each wall so that they can have full, um, you know, 360 degree beam steering of this massive transmitting antenna. So these are um, all a series of transmitters and all, all the little points on this uh, this phased array thing. You can go look up phased array on, on Wikipedia to fi find that and um, scroll through some of the, yeah, the, this is like the early one where they just use three antennas and they phase different uh, frequencies at the same frequency at just at different times to the different antennas to um, make this directional beam steering. Um, type of technology and you can see this massive this is a lift one of those lifts that you see out in front of Home Depot or something uh, right there in the foreground and in, in front of this massive it's got to be 50 feet tall that's got to be a, a 50 footer you know maybe even taller lift but the, yeah that's a serious piece of equipment and um, you know, to think that they have even bigger uh, situations and stuff is, is pretty nuts. So this is cool. Um, if you guys have seen this, I, I don't want to get um, caught for the copyright uh, for, for watching it, but I'd, I'd show parts of it. Um, but I'll summarize the basis of, of the, the, the important actionable scientific intelligence that we can get from it. And that's this patent that they showed briefly at um, one point during the the presentation by this Carl Kiefer guy. So I'll, I'll share that with you all now. Um, and I'd love to get you guys, uh, you know, some, some, um, yeah, it's multi antenna. There's an array of antennas, and the phase, the phased array means that, that they send a different, um, signal to each antenna to transmit a different phase um, and when they phase them correctly you can get them to to the directional beam steering like uh was shown in that, that other video there <clears throat> yeah my buddy um steve ellswick actually wrote the first book on harp so um he knows a lot about this stuff too man he's uh Pretty cool guy, Tesla Tech. He runs the Tesla Tech conference there, and out down in Albuquerque. Which um, they're they're starting up at TeslaTech.info if people want to go and and check out that live conference. And um, but yeah, they use this uh, carrier signal and then the this other signal in this antenna system. They get this parabolic dish with a twenty decibel gain. And uh, this shows a person at 10 meters away. And, uh, yeah, they can point this beam. This is, they don't need the beam steering and they don't need the phased array so much. As uh, you, you see in that, it's interesting because in, in the, um, that fictional gun that it shows, Yeah, in that fictional gun, it shows these six. It's got six with the one in the center, so seven of these um, antenna transmitters. So that's like a kind of like a phased array um, setup in the fictional one, which is interesting. Um, although if you had a parabolic dish and a gun type of thing, you, you wouldn't have to worry about the phase array because you could pretty much point in direction uh, the beam that you wanted to shoot. And... Um, and I don't know what this says about the frequencies and stuff, but um, it would be interesting. Yeah, so there's this microwave auditory frequency, and if you blast that high enough, it will really blow. It will really uh, hurt your inner ear and, and make your head scream. Um, so those might be the uh, the frequencies that they're really looking at and trying to do when they run this thing. Um, course you can modulate um tones over those frequencies so you can give people like the voice of god and, and, and crazy stuff i heard um yeah 
the thunder gun man um i don't know that what is the frequency range for parabolic dishes google Let's see if 1.3 to 886 gigahertz. You are correct. Those are the bands that are supported by the, the parabolic dish. Yeah, so what kind of frequency range are we talking about with, uh, you know, let's see, microwave auditory effect. Let's see what frequency frequency range let's see what the frequency range is okay so that's 200 to 6500 megahertz yeah so yeah megahertz would be below that uh, gigahertz threshold for the parabolic antenna you are correct so if we were dealing with microwave auditory effect weapon then then it's of course a different frequency range so um but of course they're not going to give you the key magical frequency that you need um, it's just got to kind of be like a uh, pulse. Uh, I don't know what, what you do, what they do. But um, yeah, that's that's pretty crazy. So the, the yeah, this is um, some interesting technology. I'll get to that some of this other stuff in a second. Um, back to the earthquake hypothesis, and uh, I did a a small paper in a project in college on on this uh where i you know we did this we had this torsional harmonic oscillator and you could drive it at, with you, you could drive it um with um electromagnetic uh, force and a frequency generator and um you know so you could drive it on resonance off resonance and uh you could um also adjust with uh the torsion in the um spring uh, the torsion constant of the uh, of the spring of the oscillator, so you could basically affect the you could also affect the damping, and um, and other parameters. Uh, you know, like I don't know, it probably, yeah, it was pretty steady frequency, so you could just affect the damping using that torsion um, in the in the thread. And um, basically, it's this uh, it's. The way the Tesla's machine worked is you just had – it's the same way that a vibrator um, device works in, in your phone. It's just a motor that's got the load off balance. So whatever is tied on the load is just an off-balanced weight. Um, that's kind of like the idea of throwing a brick into a uh, – you ever seen the video where they, they throw the brick into um, – let's find that – in the washing machine brick in a washing machine yeah yeah it just now add the brick There's another one in there. See the vibration's getting more intense. There's another one in there. Now, now the vibration is overcoming the damping of the machine itself, the weight of the gravity. Because the... normally the, the, this uh, vibration is being dampened by the grass. The vibration at the bottom is like washing. So now he's added enough weight where the driving function has now overcome the dampening function um, built into the uh, engineering of the, of the machine itself. And
yeah as you see that's yeah the mic was cutting out sorry but uh it's it's the, the video is playing live, live through the speakers it's not i'd have to like um close it out and, and do separately to, to but anyway, whatever it's it's uh, uh i have to do this because it's a mac so it's it is what it is for right now and some all my podcasting equipment got stolen and robbed uh, from me so i'm just working with bare minimum now guys i'm really sorry um hopefully i got a good i got a good lab now with uh good security in the building so it's um and i'm much more safe with my stuff now but i won't let that ever happen again um but yeah this is uh in basics of an earthquake machine kind of you know where you have uh some pr the parameters of the of the equation are are like this um basically the impedance function um is the way we learned it you know so you have the impedance equation for um resistance capacitance and uh, inductance and um it kind of relates to um relation to um oscillators yes yeah, so let's see what we got yes yeah, so impedance in the driven harmonic oscillator um you'll find some good uh, videos on this and explain the physics of it i won't bore you all and go into a, a a physics homework help now because we only have 111 people watching and and uh we don't lo completely lose everyone um we won't do, to do a deep dive into that but uh the basics of it is that uh, you, you have a uh, three parts of this equation and um it kind of works like it kind of works like a uh the three terms of the um you know the inductance is your acceleration the resistance is like your position and uh the um capacitance is like your velocity in in, in some way in, in like a, a certain sense so you you can translate those terms and it works with the same kind of engineering equation it's they say all engineering schools you're, you're taught this this one differential equation and, and how to apply it to like different uh, types of engineering um but yeah it's, it's basically the type of the engineering is you have to figure out the resonant frequency of whatever you're dealing with and sometimes there's more than one um there's lots of them sometimes so but there's one fundamental frequency and once you find that one fundamental frequency uh, you have to drive it at uh, a significant enough force um, for it to overcome that damping so basically like the brick in the washing machine if you want to you know think about the washing machine like your building and uh like the new yorker hotel where tesla was staying and uh he had a big enough brick on that machine where it started rocking the whole building and getting the building going and uh it caused enough of the ruckus where the fire department had to come in and smash the machine according to the history of it and uh they um it's basically the, the same idea is you have uh, the fundamental frequency of the um washer is probably tuned to something different you know to the structural stability of it is tuned to something if it was at the same frequency as the thing rotates at then then you'd have bad um the thing would just fall apart so you have to that would be the first step of engineering so that the frame is at a completely different structural frequency than than what the inside you know rotates at and then it's just a matter of uh over overcoming that with um enough uh bricks or whatever but it's uh it's essentially like you have a fundamental frequency and um you can find it with some what's called the q factor of resonance right so the resonance q factor yeah is an important part this yeah this is good we'll, we'll explain it for engineers academy 
some good uh good explanational videos that will go through the whole derivation for you on how to um, basically you have to find this resonant frequency and everything's got one and then uh, you'll have a Q factor so you, you'll hit that frequency but you know you'll notice there's a little bit of this curve so you can go a little bit to the right or left of that frequency and and still be you know relatively at, at full power um, or with 90 percent you know 95 percent or above power um, to within a degree of what the what's called the Q factor, and that's how much movement you have um, with the uh, you know the, the tuner on the radio, for example. They have to fine tune that Q factor um, so that you don't get crossover in the radio stations, because you know sometimes you can hear another station coming through. That means your Q factor and your your brought is too broad a band, and that you're not tuned in uh, fine enough to the single frequency that you're trying to listen to. Your your overlapping frequencies and stuff. So um, the key part is to find the fundamental frequency, and all objects have one. And um, and then you start from there, and you can engineer the size of the electromagnetic waves because you know the the speed of electromagnetic waves in a vacuum or the speed of electromagnetic waves in water right so if you want to know the speed of electromagnetic waves in human bodies or any kind of body that's pretty much the speed of light in water um so there's all everything an engineer would need to do the calculations uh and i won't you know, go through all that for you. I'll, I'll leave that for the engineers uh, to have that fun on their own because um, it's only a select breed of us that find things like that fun. Um, but yeah, this is a, this is a cool thing. Um, this patent apparently with this invention of like, you know, this microwave, these auditory and microwave effects and stuff. Um, oh, thanks for the super chat, by the way. Uh, TW. For the 799 and also thank you Taryn art for the five you guys rock every little bit helps so thank you thank you for that and you know feel free to ask a question with your super chat too you know i'll be happy to answer you guys i will i do read all super chats and answer questions so um shout it out if you got one but uh yeah so check this out the application was filed by Invocon Incorporated, which I went and looked up and I found, oh, here's a video of Invocon from NASA. You know, I'm going to uh, share this and I'm going to present the audio. So I got to log out of that. Um, tab Invocon. Yeah, that's it. Check this out. We're going to watch this. This is, this is also fair use. So this is a NASA video. I did not make this video. This is a, a NASA official video. On NASA. In a complex YouTube engineering video. system, it's critical to understand how all of the parts are functioning at any given moment. When that system is in a harsh environment, it becomes even more critical. Imagine if you had a way to constantly monitor the system, regardless of where it is. For a number of its systems, NASA has relied on a small company in Conroe, Texas, to provide monitoring solutions. Invocon has been developing miniature, low-power, wireless data acquisition and communication systems since the mid-1980s. Early on, the company's president, Carl Kiefer, envisioned putting a network of sensors on a NASA structure, each sensor acting as a relay source for the network. We produced drawings of astronauts floating around a, a drawing of what we thought a space station might look like. Uh, and uh, those astronauts are floating around putting little sensors on the space station. I think it was 12 years or 10 years to the day later, uh, we actually watched astronauts live uh, put our system and install it on one of the tops of the trusses of the space station. Today, an Invocon Internal Wireless Instrumentation System, or IWIS, collects data on the impulse response of the International Space Station and verifies the station's integrity while it's in orbit. The firm is now building EWIS that will go on the ends of the station's solar array trusses to monitor the impulses that occur whenever the station is reboosted or has a docking. Kiefer compares the impulses to a tuning fork. If you hit a tuning fork, it rings for a while and then it stops. So you can think of us as the 
the ear that listens to the, the tuning fork response of the space station. The EWIS will record the microgravity changes to the nearest half a millionth of a G when the station experiences such an impulse. Because of its success with monitoring technologies, Invocon was tasked to design a number of systems for NASA's return to flight shuttle mission STS-114. In fact, the firm actually had four different monitoring systems on board, and all four had their genesis in the SBIR program. One system monitored the leading edges of the shuttle wings for impacts. One monitored the stresses on part of the main engines during launch. Another monitored payload vibration during launch and landing, and another monitored temperatures during a thermal protection system repair experiment. Invocon developed various aspects of the leading edge monitoring system to be controlled from the ground. A software glitch in the system did occur, and the firm's technology allowed engineers back on Earth to correct it. Although Kiefer was happy with all of their monitoring systems, he was especially happy about fixing that glitch. I was prouder of that than I would have been had the thing just worked perfectly because it was like Apollo 13. Not only did you do it, you saved your day. Invocon is working with NASA on other monitoring solutions. They're collaborating with Johnson Space Center and the Navy to transition some technology to NASA that was originally developed for the Navy. The technology can map the spread of a catastrophic event, such as an explosion. Under an SBIR contract from Langley Research Center, the firm is developing technology that can identify the area of an impact on any space vehicle. As NASA continues on a journey of exploration, Invocon will work on providing solutions to monitor the agency's new systems and structures. Well, there you have it. I mean, I didn't make this up, but they talk about the ESPERS program. This was 10 years ago um, that this ESPERS program was in place. So that that, that will give you some uh, context of, you know, that's the space-based infrared if you, if you haven't been uh, know about that. Um, yeah, so that's pretty crazy. <laughs> Um, the stuff that's come out, man, this is real disclosure guys. And, um, we, we were doing, we do it on this channel, man. This is crazy stuff. Uh, let's, let's, uh, go back. Elver had a great, great, uh, five pound super chat over there in the UK across the pond. Thank you. Uh, Elver Loho, have you looked into the Bohm Aronov effect and its alleged connections with scalar weapons and inducing earthquakes? Yeah, I've read a bunch of papers on this. I have not looked into it personally, um, done any experiments on this uh, per se, but you know, it's kind of uh, that's kind of like the, I haven't done a lot of any experiments with. Uh, you know the Havana syndrome stuff, or earthquake machines, or or weapons of stuff like that, because it's um, yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I just don't know uh, if that's a, a safe uh, territory to be, you know, or a fruitful one, you know, for for that matter, because there's already people working on these weapons in our government, and I don't really want to build weapons. I want to, I I want to build things that um, save the world, and you know, if we could find a way to use scalar energy to have, you know, create nuclear fusion um you know through a mag you know quantum bottle uh or i don't know hydroton um any one of these models of how you'd fuse um atoms at low energy instead of the immense temperatures and pressures that uh, our sun uses to uh, power all the all the uh, current energy that we use um here on earth yeah so it would be yeah, I don't know. Uh, the scalar stuff is interesting. Also, other dimensional, you know, stuff like the quasi crystals that you know you have quasi crystals which you resonate them in in three dimensional space. Um, they could have some kind of resonant effects and in, and in, in hyper dimensions potentially. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of research that I want to do and get involved in this. Um, I haven't gotten there yet, um, but. I did think this was uh, this was pretty cool. This Invocon uh, connection here that I got through this this guy Carl uh, Kiefer, very interesting guy. Um, 
quite an, an, a number of interesting patents uh, once you get into the patent, if people that do the patent searches and, and really dig into that kind of stuff too. Lots of interesting stuff there. You work for this Gas Research Institute and Electric Power Research Institute. These are like, these sound like generic companies that were just made up by like the CIA to investigate different you know, technologies or something. This is the, these don't sound, I don't know. Have you ever heard of these? Like maybe this is a real thing and I'm just not familiar with the Gas Research Institute. Um, maybe someone can enlighten me on, <laughs> on that. Um, but yeah, the Infocon uh, thing was interesting with the NASA connection and talking about espers and all these, you know, advanced sensors technology that they're putting on these uh, these advanced uh, spy satellites because uh, you know the NSA and the, and, the, and the spy satellite programs you know way bigger than you know any space station or the missions that were you know the public knows about that we're doing up there um, but yeah there was um, they they this was a year ago. February, uh, actually two years ago, where they, where they were saying they couldn't attribute it to a foreign actor. And now they're saying it was this Russian guy that they arrested. And um, it's kind of weird because they they haven't actually shown the uh, video. Uh, you know, they showed a video of this guy getting pulled over on the 60 Minutes Havana Syndrome thing, right? They showed this video of the guy getting pulled over but they didn't have um you know they showed him they don't show the video of of what the machine looked like whatever he had whatever the equipment was that this guy had when he was pulled over they don't show it they show this right here whatever he has in the bag and it's not shown but there's a looks like a cone or a speaker here he's got a headset right here for monitoring they don't show the actual device i don't think i don't see it here anyway i don't know if this is this is it maybe this is it on the ground this this thing but he had a russian passport russian uh, paper on but um one of the devices this device right here someone identified as just a regular car code reader um, so I don't know, maybe this was a code reader that was, a, you know, made to look like a code reader, but this is really a, a, some type of weapon system because this looks like a plate of some kind with, you know, like he whole, this is like a, is that a laptop with a, a sticker on it that looks like a speaker? Or is that an actual speaker? I don't know. It looks like it could be three dimensional or with like a tube kind of microwave antenna horn. I don't know what is this the, the actual device what is this thing here so I, there's a lot of uh and then he's got this look at this it's, it's like a this could be the um foldable collapsible um shroud it looks like a a, a shroud that you use for um flash photography to kind of a, like a parabolic shroud to focus all the light for for you know for or not or either flash photography or um you know lighting and maybe that's what he uses for the maybe that's good with the frequency range of, of whatever the device that he's using but i don't know it's got the right connector on the end this thing that just connects to a car so maybe that that's the wrong thing though who knows man um really crazy but yeah the aeronaut bomb effect um and all that scalar weapons stuff is is is, is interesting. You know, I was watching, uh, rewatching some of the old. Um, what's his name there? Um, you guys know who I'm talking about. The the um, who's the old guy? Oh, Ashton Forbes was had him on recently, man. He was talking about him. Um, why, why am I drawing a blank on? I can't believe I do this. With him. So Ashton has like 
he had Jack Sarfati on recently. He had Mark on recently. Um, he had Dave Rossi. He had Sal Pays on. He's diving into the science. Yeah, Tom Bearden. He was talking about the super weapons and Tom Bearden stuff and, and the scalar physics stuff. So, yeah, that's that's interesting stuff. And there's a lot of claims that are made. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, you have to deal with energy conservation. So you have to find out where the energy is coming from, where it's going. You can't get energy from nothing. Um yeah, there's some radical new theories about dark energy and all that crap, but it's it's a bunch of bunk as far as I'm concerned. And a um, bunch of physics fails. But yeah, energy conservation is is the uh, is a key part of physics, man. It's it's just a it's just a fact. And um, not gonna be able to scale or, or anything. You can't just get tons of energy out of nothing and, and you have to obey like physical energy laws so if there's like bonding energy of in your undoing bonds um you can't get more energy than than you put in you can't get energy out of nothing unless you can get fusion energy because there's tons of energy in mass right so e equals mc squared this there's, there's tons of energy if you can convert mass into energy uh through fusion then you'd be you'd be rocking and rolling and balling um but you know, so far, man, that's that's uh, good luck. And if you are want to pursue that, and you're good, you know, you've got a lab and, and the science to it. Uh, I'd love to see it. Um, so far, there's. Let me see what, what um, Mitchell Schwartz is doing at his lab up at MIT there for cold fusion. Um, anything? Any new patents from Mitchell? Uh, these are different patents. Oh, these are cool. Huh? Well, well then. Anyways, um, yeah, there's a uh, Boston Marathon is coming up too on Monday. We got the eclipse coming this weekend. Those of you who are going down to uh wherever i i guess i don't know where where it is um by the way i posted the uh the link if um i don't know michael said he might he might have wanted to join i'm gonna email it to him as well yeah there you go yeah so we got the the boston marathon coming on monday we got the eclipse over the weekend you know um i was on a podcast recently called the what is truth podcast um they'd have a teaser up on youtube but it's uh it's mostly on these other um channels on on rockfin and um what's the other one there uh odyssey and Rockfin, yeah. So he's on Odyssey and Rockfin, and those are less uh, censored platforms. So we got to unleash a little bit more than we usually do on YouTube. It seems that when I start talking about serious topics and and real stuff, uh, you get um, <laughs> they have uh, you know people people start signing out and stuff. Um, you know, I know people don't like Ashton, so that that they. they uh, they'll get off if i start talking about him but yeah oh yeah he had simon holland on recently too that was another good one so um yeah it's good that people um with you know the a layman understanding of the science are digging into it uh but they also have to understand that you know there's there is real science to this and there's a lot of bullshitters out there too a lot of you know people that exaggerate claims and stuff so it's it's important to verify um, with science, just like anything else, um, as best you can. So, um, you know, when I was on this podcast, he asked me a lot about, you know, my methods for verifying, you know, stuff and, and, and betting bullshit and making sure you don't get cut your teeth on disinfo and, uh, get sucked down false rabbit holes and stuff. And, um, like I, I'm pretty sure this guy, he referred me to on that podcast um it's got sucked down some of the bad rabbit holes he did this podcast uh, with this guy 
um, David McGowan on the Caravan to Midnight John B. Wells podcast show. And um, he talks, he says all the same old stuff on uh, the Boston Marathon bombing. We had a, 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 a Facebook page called the Boston Marathon Bombing Think Tank where we, we, we went into detail on all these different theories and, and debunked a lot of them. And, um, you know, I referred him to my you know, debunking that I put out as well. And if you go to, you won't be able to find this if you search for it, but you have to go to Alien Scientist YouTube channel specifically, go to the search bar, and then you can type in Boston Marathon, uh, yeah, or Boston Bombing. And you can see some of the videos I put up where I went to the actual crime scenes and, you know, I showed footage, you know, firsthand of me going there when they opened the city back up to show that there was, you know, the bomb damage that they had cleaned up some of it and boarded up the windows and stuff. But you, you could definitely see um, what took the brunt of the, uh, the explosion and, and, and the damage that it did cause the two different bombs. I went to both uh, the bombing locations. You know, here's the first bomb site, and there's the second bomb blast site. Um, and I filmed exactly where those were, show, you know, so people can look those up and know um, where they were. And then I also went to the Watertown Mass shootout and, and the apprehension site where the boat was in the yard on uh, Walnut Street to the, the shooting on Dexter and Laurel, Laurel Street. And uh, I also identified, you know, Craft International and... Um, yeah, it was it was Kraft International, and um, the Infowars. Remember Alex Jones? He was saying that these these Kraft International guys um, were the ones who planted the bombs, and they're like, "Hey, dude, where'd your backpack go?" Because this guy had his backpack on, and then there's another picture of him running with no backpack on, and all that kind of crap. And um, you know, I went through that whole thing uh, in detail, and um, you know. I show the memes, you know, they had the, the memes that were up about, you know, hey, bro, where, where's your backpack? The backpack's right here. It shows them responding. They run up the street. This is the immediate aftermath of the, the first response. And then I also show this video, which is important because it places those two uh, suspects that, I, you know, Alex Jones, you know, alleged that these guys did the bombing. Uh, so... I showed the video where you can see them, you know, here's the crowd, they respond to the bombing, and then this guy runs by with the backpack on responding to it. And I show on the markers where that location was in um, Copley Square, right near the Mar Boston Marathon bomb um, Boston Marathon finishing line, and uh, this church here right by the, the, the uh, I think that's Co um, Copley Plaza Station um, on Dartmouth Street, and uh, this is Boylston Street. Um, yeah, so that guy definitely didn't plant the backpack. He was a block and a half away um, with the backpack on and responded to it. This kid right here can be seen right here putting it down, definitely planting the backpack. Here he is without the backpack on, running from the, the scene with frightened people around. Here he is carrying the backpack to the scene. The blown apart backpack was, of course, the inside out. And there were also two back, uh, I believe, two backpacks. He, this guy had one, too. So, um, you know, people confuse the backpacks. People confuse all kinds of stuff. And, and people who really suck at doing just forensics and, and general investigation were spreading all kinds of nonsense conspiracy theories before they had any idea what was going on and, and any idea what they were talking about. And uh, that was evident from that interview. I couldn't listen to. Um, I couldn't listen to much of this guy. I couldn't believe that he went on for three, four hours uh, with this nonsense because it's it's all it's. There's no evidence here presented whatsoever. It's all speculation and opinion, and um, about the, the and very graphic pictures too, going over all the. Uh, you know, I, don't, I can't even show that stuff. It, it, it's horrible um alleging that you know guys were fake and crisis actors and stuff and and i actually um i met jeff bauman's 
I didn't meet him, but I talked to him anyways, uh, Jeff Bauman's brother, Chris, and uh, Jeff Bauman's the kid that lost both of his legs, and they, you know, the conspiracies were th saying that he was a disabled Iraq war veteran named Nick Vaught and all this weird crap, man. I had to be debunked all that nonsense. Uh, so you guys um, go check that out if you're interested in, uh, you know, because I'm sure that you're going to see some of that coming up again. Um, for sure. Uh, but yeah, here's the, here's the link on Odyssey to, to that. And then, then my show is up here, number 179, up there on Odyssey. Um, still haven't worked out how to get this channel on Odyssey and all of those other channels. It's just too much extra work for me right now. Um, but anyways, um, yeah, you can go check out my uh, investigations into the Boston bombing and that's one thing. If there was a conspiracy, it was with the Sarna brothers and how they got here and why they didn't, you know, and the whole FBI interview with his cousin there and the whole Waltham murder, triple murder investigation that they got pinned for um, with those three kids out in Waltham that were the big weed dealers that, that got killed and, and they blamed uh, those guys. Oh, yeah, seven months, dude. Holy crap. Thank you. Thank you so much for the membership, guys. And don't forget, memberships and all that stuff really, really help um, a lot. So if you can you can help me out with that, that would be awesome. One of the projects that I want to do, I might need some help with, is uh, this quasi-crystal project. So this guy shows you. He shows you how to do the plots, and this is how to, you know, these are the three, the four different pieces, and then um, these are the rules. There's different rules for matching them together, and how you build that. You actually build the structure of the cell of the quasi crystal. Um, so he has it all mapped out here in uh, Wolf from Alpha, but and then he plotted. He plots the um, all the vector plots. So he's, and then he shared the file with it. Somebody finally, you know, said it's only, it doesn't have a lot of views this guy has. You know, this has been up for a while, but someone pestered him and said, hey, is the raw code available at all? And he said, um, you know, oh, it, it's here on, you know, Git, GitHub. So I have the CSV file, but I have to turn these raw vector code, uh, CSV um, code into a plot in, um, a 3D modeling software, which I still haven't figured out how to do, but I'll work on it next week. And um, once I get that into some 3D modeling software, I can start um, plotting that out and I can actually build one of these quasi crystals in, um, in real time. And uh, you can see that this guy did in fact do that um, years ago and had these, you know, the, and got them printed from Shapeways even with, you know, so he's got an, he's got a file for all this stuff somewhere, but I'm going to need the STL file. So that's what I got to do. That's my goal for next week is to turn this CSV code into an STL file that I can then slice and print on a 3d printer. Cause that would just be so cool and awesome. I don't know. What do you guys think? Is it worth the time? Is it worth the effort? Be cool things to have. Would you buy one if I put these on the on the alien scientist store? How much would you pay for for one of these? You know, three D prints of a, of a of a quasi crystal. If I if I if I put that up on the store, I'm gonna have to give Casey some royalties for doing this. I told him I told him that I'd uh, I told him that I would. Um, get him on my podcast and also get him on um, try to get him on some of these other podcasts for my friends shows, but he's got a, uh, a pretty awesome new um, program and a whole idea uh, for basically he uses energy, all the excess energy that you get from solar that you can't use during the day that, that, because they're, they're getting so much solar now built that they can't use it up during the day. So they need to do something with the solar during the day um, so that we can have more energy at night. 
And uh, one method is storing that energy in the form of hydro hydrocarbons. It's a, it's a great idea. And so he's got this whole um, way of, you know, cheap natural gas, renewable natural gas from cheap solar. Um, so you get this cheap solar energy during the day when they're pumping out tons of it and you can use it for different ideas. So he's got a company now. Um, they just, it's called, his company is called Terraform Industries. And he just did an interview on Payload Podcasts uh, here. Uh, it's a small little pot, growing podcast um, where, yeah, he did an interview talking about all this stuff, talking about his work for, he worked for SpaceX and, uh, and Elon Musk and, and, and a, a bunch of these, uh, these other people as an engineer. So this guy's, this guy's awesome. And he's into quasi crystals. Um, I really want to get him on the show for an interview and talk to him. This was a decent interview, but, um, you know, this kid, uh, he asked him like some pretty, un pretty just dumb questions like the moon landing was what he, although that was a cool intro because it got it kind of got him talking about certain things but you know i don't really but anyways it was wasn't the best uh i i feel like he could have gotten more technical and better in, into some of the deep dive topics but you pay 20 bucks for one of those heck yeah you yeah yeah see 20 bucks if i 3d print those and sell them for 20 bucks no problem people will buy them all day that'd be great and um you know every uh so many i sell I'll, I'll throw something back to to casey if i if you know if i make it i don't think i'll make too, too much money off them but um i'm sure he's making enough money with his company now that he's not worried about um, a couple 3d prints of quasi crystals for educational purposes for uh, you know some guys like us that are just trying to raise money to build uh more technology and stuff so um, I think what he's doing is awesome, and I want to definitely interview more people like him and uh, in the future and get more people on board with you know these the star this whole starship program. He talks about the whole the, the, the whole starship program. I don't, I don't know if that's the hundred year starship program, but the whole idea of us getting off the planet in the next hundred years and really building towards that. Um, yeah, those bismuth magnesium things, we're working on those. We're still um, progressing on that. We, we took a little time back. We, we want to get these silver inks to market so that we can have something that's making a little income for the for the company right now because we're, we're just uh, here. Oh, Michael's here to join us too, so Michael can talk more to that. What's up, man? What's up, Esoteric? Yeah, the bismuth magnesium chips, we're, we're working on that experiment now. And um, although, Michael, did you say you thought those were for some kind of shielding? Oh, you're muted. Let me see. You have to unmute your mic. Sorry. There we go. Okay. Yeah, so uh, the bismuth magnesium, um, at least on my end, um, yeah, the silver ink uh that's something we were working on for a, a, a company potentially so that that could be a nice uh consistent revenue stream to uh, to put back into all of the research that we're doing here so reinvest that ideally um so yeah it was we were playing around with this earlier in the week um or earlier last week and um ultimately that little clamp uh that i got there I uh, wasn't able to provide enough uh, pressure to really get these things to fuse properly. Um, so, like, we found that the temperature required to fuse the bismuth magnesium layers was not very high. So, like, we didn't really have to hit it with a blowtorch or anything to get it to happen. So, uh, now we're going to get, a like, a press, like, to make, like, they have these presses that press, like, the oils out of, like, marijuana plants. And those go up to like three tons of pressure, which is plenty for what we need here. So uh, we're going to try. Uh, yeah, we're going to try making. Uh, I mean, oh, yeah, like, like that, like that. That's not exactly the one, but uh, yeah, look, I just looked it up real quick. There's some, you know, but, but yeah, I mean, um, we found that uh, high temperature, higher temperature was bad for adhesion. So there's like not too much like lower temperatures are better and if uh, higher pressures assist adhesion uh 
in, at, at any temperature. So uh, we're, we've, we've got it dialed in now where like we, we know how much force roughly that it will take to fuse these layers. And then uh, we don't have to apply all of that much temperature to get the fusing to happen. So uh, it, you know, it's a simple lamination process effectively is what we're finding. Mm. And it's not even high temp. It's not even that high temp. It just needs a lot of pressure. Need some high pre well, not a lot of pressure. I mean, three tons isn't, you know, I mean. <laughs> well, I mean, so like we don't need three tons over a tiny piece like that. I mean, we'll, ton be making press. Larger, we'll be making larger flakes of this stuff ideally. But yeah, I think um, the initial tests were promising. Were very promising. There were uh, there were a few smaller pieces. So like instead of a um, taking up more, like most of the edge of the clamp like that, we would had some samples that were about half that size. And then for those samples, the, it, it, they fused really nicely. The the interlayer bonding, I mean, it's still somewhat brittle at the interface, but you really have to like pick at it to separate out the layers. So um, it's, yeah, it's pretty good. Um, personally, I think that the bismuth magnesium is some sort of electrochemical process. It looks more of an electrochemical thing, but um, that's an aside. Uh, yeah, so I, personally, I think it it might be radiation shielding, uh, and that's just because, like, uh, if if you look at what they do in uh, like nuclear reactors and stuff, they have a composite of like polymers, like polyethylene, and um, and, and tungsten powder. Um, that's not really how radiation shielding works, uh, at least not for like alphas and, and gammas and, and betas. Uh, no, you, you see, typically for radiation shielding, you want something with small nuclei and something with large nuclei. So that, uh, so the, I forget what, I forget why exactly, but uh, something about having the small nuclei and the large nuclei, there's uh, different types of radiation that will hit these things and they'll uh, recoil in different ways. So, um, it turns out that if you mix like super heavy, like heavier nuclei and lighter nuclei, then you get the best of both uh, situations, and uh, it, it uh, blocks more radiation that way. So there's a uh, like, yeah, so something along those lines. I, I don't recall exactly. Oh, and then neutrons as well. Neutrons as well. Yeah, but um, yeah, I mean. Magnesium doesn't seem like an optimal material for radiation shielding, to me at least. Uh, bismuth, I mean, there's lead bismuth nuclear reactors that use those as coolant, uh, those those liquid metals as coolant. So uh, that's, I mean, bismuth will last. Um, I think beryllium was the one that gets irradiated and becomes radioactive. I forget whether magnesium becomes radioactive over time if you irradiate it. Uh, but either way, um, back at this was so assuming the Roswell crash was 1947, is that correct? Am I remember? Is that I remember, or am I misremembering the date? I July think 1947. Good, good. So yeah, assuming it's 1947, we're talking about like World War II era, so very early nuclear program stuff. And like, if you look at the later nuclear program stuff, I like I don't know. Um, I, well, actually, I don't know how much I can say about the uh, the missile, the nuclear missile programs, but uh, I mean, they, they also had these like laminations for their shielding because like you, if, you, if you're going to have like a rocket or something, you're going to want to build it out of like lighter elements if possible so you can get more range out of it. But then you also need the heavy elements in a lamination to like get the best structural strength, but also decent radiation shielding so i guess i won't go into like so we made the argument that you know teflon i mean bopat or mylar wasn't invented until um you know like the 54 so that was like a couple of years after the roswell but someone pointed out that pat um was uh was actually invented you know prior to that you know in the 19 mid 1940s yeah, but you're, you're not going to be 
I mean, especially if plastics are very new and you don't know necessarily what their physical properties are and you know that they can combust, uh, you're not going to be building like rocket hulls out of that. So like yeah. if you're going to make a PET composite with tungsten, that would be nice. Uh, at the time, though, I'm not certain how much they knew about which things block which radiations. Um, but like, like I could see them using magnesium because they just didn't know that it becomes radioactive over time or something, or they didn't care in the specific case for a warhead where like they just need to have it be as light as possible while still being relatively structural. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, I mean, if you have these bismuth magnesium layers, now you've got a light element and you've got your heavy element and you've got like, you're, you're deflecting all the different types of radiation as optimally as you can for a given weight. And then like later on, you've got stuff like ha hafnium and tantalum and things, but you know, I won't go into that too much. Right, 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 right. But yeah, I mean, I think this looks like an early, cause like back then they were, if I recall correctly, they were, they were looking at uh, lead bismuth, alloys for nuclear reactors in the research in 1947 by night by 1947 they had reactors with the uh, stuff like that as as a uh, coolant or shielding at least like people knew she uh, people knew lead was good shielding from the start and i guess maybe uh they had some idea about bismuth but yeah, yeah it looks like a not like lead layer layers of lead you know or yeah and this was uh russell was near white sands missile range right so maybe they were testing something out kind of i mean is near anything in new mexico is like yeah you're near there but it's like a four-hour drive you know? <laughs> well not for not for a missile i mean that's that's in the air so right 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 it goes off course uh, so anyway i um that's why I was thinking like my uh, my top hypothesis is like this is a very early like attempt at radiation shielding, perhaps um, back in the prototypical. And then maybe something went wrong with it, uh, which is not surprising because I mean, actually, I yeah, look even at the um, that picture over there. What was that? Actually, go back. This is opto mechanical. Oh, go back before this. It's not letting you. What was the previous tab? Oh yeah, well, the arts part. They, yeah, look at that arts parts picture at the top. Is it delaminating right there? Actually, I thought they said it's not supposed to. Yeah, it's delaminating. It's totally delaminating at the bottom. It looks like it. Yeah. It looks cloven. Yeah, I mean that's what I was saying. Like you're not gonna get perfect. Like so they were saying, oh, this thing adheres perfectly and you can't break it. Well, evidently you can, right there. And I, I was like. It, Looking at all my tests, like we can get the mechanical strength to be pretty good, but bismuth is brittle, and the interface between bismuth and magnesium they're dissimilar metals, so you're only going to get so much. So I'm not surprised that it's delaminating there. That's interesting, but yeah, I mean, just goes to show, like, can't trust uh, some of those folks what they say. Yeah. It looks an awful lot like slag in this picture, too. Like, no, no, it's not slag. This looks like it's electrochemical. Hmm. The way it's layered, it looks like a, yeah. a battery or something. Yeah, but yeah. It, yeah. Could, it could have been a laminate that was heavily damaged <clears throat> by reentry or something. Especially because, assuming that this is the outer surface, it's very magnesium rich. And the outer surface, if it had any bismuth, that would have been burned off by reentry or or fires or some something that went wrong magnesium yeah maybe they, that would that would definitely be a bad thing to make your reentry hull out of fair um but yeah that's another reason why i'm thinking it might be a uh a rocket material not necessarily a because like back then they were they were using like uh aluminum and, and magnesium for the uh actual the, yeah the shuttle wasn't that like mostly mostly aluminum with some magnesium, just to, for the weight savings? I, I mean, that's, that's why you had so many shuttles blow up because like you had these shuttle tiles. But if the shuttle tiles fell off, the failure was catastrophic. And that's that's like why Elon's using steel instead of like 
because if you have steel and the, the shuttle tile falls off, the steel is still going to hold up pretty well, as long as there's not too many shuttle tiles off. So it's more reliable. But anyway. Yeah, um, definitely. Yeah, so, I mean, there's there's a ton of stuff that, yeah, it's exciting, though. We like we, we can make these bismuth magnesium laminates for people to play with now, and that's going to be super exciting. And I, I, I'm excited to see what people are going to do with that, uh, what, what they're going to try. Because now we can we can like play with terahertz, hit it with the uh, hit it with terahertz, see if it floats. Uh, although I should mention that they were saying that with the terahertz frequencies, you have to coat it with cadmium selenide nanoparticles as well to get the terahertz. Uh, like uh, the the nanoparticles basically fluoresce in the terahertz range, and that uh, creates some sort of population inversion and lazing in the uh, in the material. I'm not sure that makes sense to me, but they, I mean, sure, why not? Let's let's quantum try it. dots, right? Make some quantum dots on there while we're at it, right? That's that's the idea, right? Yeah. So, um, but yeah, this this uh, it, there's a there's a number of things it could be. I would be curious to see how it shields radiation. I'd be curious to see yeah. like. So this is something that these people talked about a long time ago. They said it's quantum confinement, these quantum dots, and it's also what they're doing is creating these things called Dirac holes, like a Dirac C on the uh, – yeah. Well, maybe. I wouldn't know enough. Uh, I mean, there's holes in, in materials. There's electrons in holes, but does that actually correspond to – so Dirac holes, that's like in vacuum, I guess, but – then you're just that's electrons and positrons, right? Yeah, positrons basically. Yeah, antiparticles. Yeah, so so okay, you make antiparticles. So what? Like it takes a lot of energy. Then what do you do with them? You know, yeah. not not trivial. But anyway, um, what else were we talking about tonight? Yeah. Um, what do you think about the idea that, uh, oh, another thing I, I wanted to mention is that, that I had this guy on my podcast um, a while you, back. You, you went on his podcast? Oh. No, I was doing like an open lines. and um, Okay. Oh, yeah. The Skull and Bones conspiracy. No, yeah. No, it's, that wasn't the guy. Uh, oh, no. Sorry. I'm trying to find it right here. So I had done this um, – six months ago no that's not the one it was the one where, where he first came on um the channel who i don't know um oh no that wasn't the one two years ago it might have been this one it was one of these ones i did uh oh yeah that was one that, that russell targ jumped on and neat but I had this guy, Eric Hecker, on. I don't know if you remember this guy. I vaguely he, ever call him. He worked on the South Pole Station for, uh, I think, Ray. Oh, Theater. that guy. Yeah, with the uh, right. he was saying that they had some scalar antenna thing going on with those. Well, the whole idea is that we, we know that harp. We know what harp is, right? So we, we know what phase array is. We know what harp is, and um, you know, harp up in Alaska is this big thing they use to mess with the ionospheric weather and they can disrupt over the horizon radar. So that's like long range radar communications um, for military uh, operations. They can basically take this um, interference and um, blast out all the signals that are being transmitted through that uh, ionosphere and bounced off of it I'm um, using this harp thing so that's the basis of what we know about it but there's speculation that you know harp could have been used to create uh, earthquakes that you know made this earthquake in Haiti and then there's uh, now speculation with from Eric Hecker and some of the other people who worked uh, uh, I don't know if there's anyone else who's worked on this that's come forward but definitely Eric Hecker um, the ice cube neutrino detector uh, down in Antarctica he's claiming is can be repurposed to um, be a, a machine just like harp. I mean, if you, it, it's a detector with all these strands that are buried deep down through the ice. So that all these um, cables go deep, deep down in the ice. So this is a huge facility with the deep core. It goes down 2,820 meters down. Um, that's this is the height of the Eiffel Tower. So we're talking, you know, way, way taller than anything we could build on the surface of the earth. And 
you know, way deeper than anything we can build anywhere else, but on the ice sheet of Antarctica, where it's just easy to drill through ice and they can drop these, um, these cable transmitters down through that ice uh, with the station. And then the idea is that if you have these things hooked up as transmitters or antennas, um, they could be an effective phased array system on a, on a scale that uh, would be like, you know, a hundred times as big as HARP. And it's encased in a dielectric and things. I don't know. I, I it, there was, 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 was also Jeremiah documents it or like uh, went over the numbers and info and like uh, verified that what Eric's saying for the capabilities is 100% accurate. It's only if they're actually doing it or not. And I was actually just talking to Eric uh, over Messenger. He's working right now. I tried sending him the link to join. But uh, he said at a future time he'll come back on to properly uh, put forward his case and the evidence that he's found with it. And specifically, uh, sorry to interrupt, I just have to bring up one last time Dutch Sense and his uh, all the work on earthquake forecasting and the cycle that he's discovered and uses. And that because of the anomaly of the Ch Christchurch uh, earthquake, uh, being different from the proper energy uh, distribution of his um, system, he was able to then like look at it and see where that energy came from and found uh, direct EM waves coming from that Antarctic array that Eric was saying was doing that and that did that and uh, has the, I forget what satellite pictures, actually has copies of the pictures of that day of the waves coming from that uh, specific array there. So we'll have to get them on to fully document that. You're saying that they have uh, proof that there were waves coming from this array? Yeah. Uh, Jeremy, maybe look up on Dutch's channel, specifically Christchurch Earthquake. Uh, and Antarctica in the title, or just the date of that specific earthquake. And he's got several videos uh, showing all of the uh, images of it, of the waves uh, traveling and stuff. Oh, he's live now. He's talking about this earthquake now, huh? Probably. What, what was the name of it? It's called... Um... The Christchurch Christ. Antarctica Anomaly Earthquake. New Zealand to uh, the only Christchurch one. So it's a one minute from eight years ago. Yeah, maybe just play that to see. So I could see maybe like if you have some sort of Hutchinson effect, you can change the rigidity of certain or the, the yeah, structural yeah, integrity of certain yeah. minerals in the ground. And maybe that could do something. But like doing that over thousands of miles. I don't know. It's a, it's already a little bit of a, I don't no, know. Data, but you said he has data for this. I'd like to see that, you know, what, what that data is. And yeah, so keep looking uh, through his mm -hmm. videos because he did several of them. And like he specifically states what uh, a satellite arrays that he took the images from and captured it. And it's like all fully documented by him. Hmm. Um, yeah, I'll check it out later. Um, but so sorry, Dan, if, I just want to bring up for anyone who would, doesn't already know, um, uh, like Eric Dollard, I don't know about this stuff here, but Eric Dollard had some real stuff on that earthquakes, um, at least for detecting them. So hmm. basically like, um, when you have piezoelectric materials and you apply a force, a stress to the material it deforms and produces a voltage so uh, that voltage drives electric currents in the ground and you can uh, you can measure those uh, those vol those voltages and currents to some extent uh, it, yes you can tell what pressure is building up in the ground because the piezoelectric uh, effect creates a voltage yeah, like, there. Yeah, so by quartz, quartz is like super common and quartz does this piezoelectric effect and it's a uh, so yeah you can see when it's happening around the earth 
and it's a you know that's very help that's a very helpful system eric dollar's working on and uh, people should go help him out also because there's a lot of stuff documented from rca back in the day radio corporation of america that still needs like transcription and uh digitization and uh archival and stuff and um i was thinking i last i heard, heard he was looking for help with that so if anyone wants to contribute to this stuff and doesn't necessarily have like super high tech skills or anything like go ahead and help him you know all yeah, you need is like of... transcribal documents but so like, i'm those... gonna try to find that video i'll be back in five minutes if i can find it cool yeah i couldn't find it man i found i seen a bunch of his his videos and stuff but did he predict this quake eric no uh, idea uh or eric no well, maybe the other guy predicts these quakes i don't well, know so so eric's got his earthquake predicting stuff set up like somewhere out in the west you would need like sensors detecting voltages and currents at all of these locations in order to have detection capability there and that's why i'm curious i, I don't understand what uh like bernie was saying just there because like okay so you have this these earthquakes and maybe they don't fit some model but then how do you go back and then see that there are actual electromagnetic waves traveling there from any specific look like did, did he go out there while it was happening and then bring some directional antennas or something like it's unclear what he means by oh we detected the electromagnetic waves associated with this so i guess i would have to look at those uh those uh videos to see what his actual evidence is but i don't know um but what i do know is yeah like you can you can use solar currents to detect uh buildup of stresses in material under the earth and that's often associated with uh or the it, it builds up before an earthquake happens so that might be useful uh, there's some limitations of course so uh, once you have some voltage from piezoelectrics in the ground uh, and the electric current dissipates that voltage entirely then you have you have no more signal but there might still be high stresses on some of the rocks under the ground yeah so, um so there's limitations on that end, uh, but the, you know, these, these solar currents are not huge or, or anything. And then, so like, if you're in an area that gets a lot of rainwater, like Eric's doing his work, like out in the desert. So your voltages will be high. They'll dissipate over long time periods and, uh, and your currents are tiny, but detectable. So, um, so the desert is, or dry arid climates are the best areas to try this type of earthquake detect uh, detection technology. In in a wet climate, you're going to get uh, you're still going to get telluric currents, but they'll they'll typically be driven by the soil chemistry. Uh, like if there's a variation in chemistry from one area to another, where maybe there's a mine and then somewhere else there's less concentration of metal ions, and then like uh, biology will drive it too. Like if you have like soil with lots of decaying micro like material and microorganisms and stuff uh, hmm. that, that can produce voltages relative to other locations potentially yeah but i mean that's only a six inches layer of topsoil so i mean you, you're talking about giant crystal rock structures with massive tons of force on them that, that, that's got to be a lot well no know. you'd be surprised like so over geological time scales like if you press some boulders together you're talking about like uh expending maybe you have like kilojoules of energy which is a decent that's a decent amount of energy but uh you're you're potentially expending that energy over uh, months or years so you're talking about like microwatts of power over however many miles or i don't know microwatts might be a little low but um you, you get what i'm trying to say like there's uh there's a there's a scale to these things and, and honestly like biology uses a lot of power like actually like if you think about like the 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 thermal output of the sun per unit volume is less than the thermal output of a person like biologically like the rate at which like biology 
energy and turns it into uh, work and heat. It is. Uh, it actually far far exceeds the sun's output, if I recall. Even though the sun's glowing, it's just a, a factor of like uh, what the equilibrium temperature is, because we have a lot we have a lot of a higher surface area to volume ratio because we're a lot smaller. But anyway, um, I digress. Um, was there anything else we wanted to talk about tonight? No, I don't know, man. Uh, I, I, there's, uh, I'm curious to see what more comes out of this. Oh, and, they're doing uh, the fireworks. Nice. Yeah, they're doing the fireworks here, man. Let's see if you can see them. That, that they have a new baseball stadium in the area, so they do that. Nice. Now, I should have stayed at the lab. I could have seen that. But I have stuff to do here. Prepping for the eclipse. That's going to so, be cool. hey, we should we should do a live uh, we should do like a, a an event here at the lab and 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 just make it a, open like to the public and and see see if we can get some people to come down. Maybe yeah, it's a cool lab space. I would be cautious though because like we got to get these experiments done and uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know. I'm uh, getting a lot of stuff done, and uh, now we get those parts ordered. I think we'll we'll uh, we'll make some headway as soon as stuff stuff starts coming in. Yeah, I'm gonna go watch these fireworks, guys. Um, so you guys, you guys have a good night, and um, let's we'll. Uh, I, I, I oh, and I wanted to I wanted to emphasize as well, like um, the, the this eBay store and all the stuff that we'll be selling. That money's all gonna be reinvested in the research to like get to the bottom of a lot of these things. Like, so now like the first piece of that now is we have magnesium bismuth composites and everyone can shortly play around with those. And uh, like, that's just the start. Like if you like this funding, this will go to like all sorts, like all sorts of hopefully like energy and gravity control technologies, who knows. I know there were some folks who were interested in generating a make, making a graviton radio. Hmm. That would be like a really useful thing to have for, um, like, search and rescue operations or like. Right. Well, that's that's another an yeah. entanglement radio or something. Yeah, that's what like Leia used in the new Star Wars movie to communicate um, discreetly. Yeah. So, anyway, uh, long story short. Uh, and any any support here that you give really helps us get to the bottom of all this stuff and see what's um, really going on, first of all, with all these, like, I don't know, um, UFO controversies, government cover-ups, who knows, whatever. But more importantly, it gets the technology that's really going to get us out of these situations with our, with our species and, like, get us off this rock, maybe, get us... Uh, sustainable and self-sufficient so that we don't necessarily have to bow to some like I don't know deep state or who knows what anyway have fun guys and yeah, yeah support support the channel uh, get some uh, get some magnesium bismuth composite that's like a this is a historic first step towards um, like breaking up these cover-ups and things, getting the science out there. So get these history and help history progress as well. We're doing it, man. Yeah. Every day. All yeah, right, cool, man. I'm glad we're here finally. You know, this has been, it took a while, a long time to get to this point and uh, now, now we can actually push forward. Uh, Hopefully we can, you know, get the, get enough support from the public behind this so the government can't shut us down before we make some progress. Yeah, we're getting there, though. So it's hopeful. Yeah, for sure. Well, guys. Bombs bursting in there. Mm-hmm. All right. Have a good night, everyone. Yeah. Yep, it's grand finale now. It's going it's going off now.